Well, here we are in springtime. It is now April. So in this video, we are going to be talking about how my solar panels have been doing for the first three months of 2024. Later on, we're going to be talking about Modbus communications. What is it? And how do we use it to get information out of our inverter and do useful things with it? So if you haven't watched my previous videos, my name is Anthony and I own nine kilowatt solar panel array. If you watched my more recent videos, you will now know that my house is almost all electric, heating, cooking, transportation, and all the usual domestic consumers, most of which is provided by my solar panels. So we're going to go to my studio and we're going to have a look at the production figures and then move on to Modbus. So here we have the overall figures for the first quarter of 2024. And in summary terms, the production figures have been pretty bad, especially in March. So for January as a whole, we generated 78 kilowatt hours of electricity. For February, we were generating 329 kilowatt hours, and that is a very close third to the second and best uh, Februarys in uh, previous years. January was quite dreadful, as you can see. The best uh, generation was 142 kilowatt hours. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail, but March was absolutely appalling. 473 kilowatt hours and you compare that to 2022 when we got 742 kilowatt hours. Massive contrast there. So looking into January in more detail, there are 11 days where production is less than three kilowatt hours. Conversely, the best day that we've had is the 30th of January. If we have a look at that in some detail, we can see some interesting things here. You can see we had a peak output of about 3.13 kilowatts. We had a dip in the middle, which is characteristic for my house. We do have a tree which gets in the way during lunchtime, and then we get a peak later on in the evening time. But this is the very best example, 11.76 kilowatt hours. Now, conversely, we should look at the worst day, which I think is this one, the 15th of January. Double click on that and then have a look at the power. What you can see is that in the middle of the day, we were generating at most 75 watts and not for very long either. Terrible day, and you'll be asking the question, how on earth can we record one kilowatt hour of production given such poor production levels here? And the answer to that question is the way Solar Edge have, in their infinite wisdom, decided to calculate production figures. They are factoring battery discharge into their production uh, figures. It's not just raw solar production which is being factored here. So that does skew the information quite a lot. In a previous video, which I did for December, I was showing a converse situation where there was three to 400 watts of production during the middle of the day, but the Solar Edge algorithm still figured that we didn't produce any electricity at all. So it's a, a very odd formula which uh, Solar Edge uh, comes up with when it comes to calculating daily production figures. One other thing you can note is that from the 23rd of January onwards, I was not at home. And that is uh, really quite obvious when you look at the uh, product, the consumption figures, you can see it, that consumption just seems to come to a much more subdued level afterwards. And still see there's still some significant consumption going on. And that's just simply my hot water controller soaking up any surplus uh, from the uh, daytime. I decided, however, to switch that off because I do, after all, make money, a decent amount of money from uh, export. So th there's no point keeping your water hot if you're not going to use it. So going into February, you can still see that I've been away up until pretty much the 14th of February. We had a much better month. And as you can see, the production figures were fairly poor in the early part of the month. There were some uh, not 
not very good days uh, for uh, three or four days at a time. But later on, we got some much brighter weather and we're getting some pretty decent figures. So if we have a look at the best day here, this is uh, the 29th of February. Hooray for leap year in this particular instance. This would have otherwise been March. We were generating a peak of nearly five kilowatts during the uh, early part, during the later part of the morning. And then the dip in the uh, lunchtime period is a lot more subdued compared to what it was in January. So that is 28 kilowatt hours of electricity being generated. So you can see that from the 24th of February onwards, the consumption is overall much higher on every single day. And that reflects the fact, of course, that heat pumps do use electricity. But nonetheless, the solar and batteries was pretty good at supplying the need for the heat pump. So I got back home on the 26th of February and from the 27th, 28th and 29th of February onwards, I was starting to adjust the settings on the heat pump to try and improve the output. If we have a look at the 29th of February as an example, we were getting uh, a lot of use out of our battery. It was charging up from 40 to 100 percent. We're getting a dip in the early part of the morning and then we're getting a good amount of uh, service from the battery all the way through until the cheap overnight period where we don't need to use the battery anymore. So this is an example on how solar plus batteries plus cheap overnight period can really reduce your running costs. So going into March you can see that the overall production figures are terrible. What we had was uh, about 12 days where production was persistently less than about three kilowatt hours during the whole day. Now we'll look at the best day of all to begin with. That's the 22nd of March. And this is uh, characteristically uh, you've got lots of export limitation due to five kilowatts of export. So that uh, shaves your uh, production at the top here. I've got some battery uh, logic which can uh, charge up your battery using uh, peak solar only. I'll be deploying that as we go into the summer months. Not very much consumption from the heat pump. It was a reasonably warm day as well. So there was uh, no need from about 10 o'clock onwards to heat my house. So that was the best day. Let's have a look at the worst day. So 10th of March, I think 2.46 kilowatt hours. Let's look at that in a bit more detail. You see not very much production at all, 446 watts. We were getting days and days of this cloudy weather coming in from the east. Lots of drizzly rain which just persisted for days at a time. But you can see here um, it wasn't very warm. It was about uh, five or six degrees during the daytime and at night time. And I'll talk about that in another video with my heat pump, specifically about my heat pump. But consumption all told was very steady. It was about 700-ish uh, watts uh, during the evening time and about uh, 500 watts during the daytime. If you look at the battery, battery didn't quite cope with uh, the uh, demand from the heat pump. But as you can see, um, the daytime production was almost enough to slow down discharge, but not quite. But nonetheless, this was the worst day. So there was some expensive electricity being used in the later part of the evening before we got to the cheap overnight period uh, from 11.30 till 5.30. But this is the very best example. As you can see, it didn't quite charge up to 100% battery. Very curiously, uh, when the mode was changing from uh, from uh, one state to another with a battery, there was a gap in the state of charge. The, the battery just went incommunicado for a, a few minutes. I've seen that only happening on two days so far. It's uh, very unusual and I have no idea why that was happening, uh, but the fact that it happened during a transition from one battery mode to another suggests there may be a software glitch, which I am unfamiliar with. But um, that is the worst day of March. What you'll see is that we were consuming more electricity on account of the heat pump than we were producing from solar power. 
You can also see here, there was a period here where we were away from home, three, three, three whole days all told. Uh, we were having a, a city break in uh, Portugal, in Lisbon. So uh, that's uh, a situation where the heat pump was uh, not being run. But all told, um, much higher overall consumption. But the, even though, uh, here's the really interesting thing, even though we were consuming more electricity, we actually made more money on our electricity bill. So here is our bill for from 6th of March to 6th of April. We exported 255 kilowatt hours. And here we consumed in the same period 306 kilowatt hours. So we consumed more than we exported. And yet when you look at consumption, 25 pounds. Go back to the export we exported 38 pounds. So we were making 13 pounds. And the reason we were making 13 pounds is because we were exporting at 15 pence per kilowatt hour. But when it comes to consumption, the average price was 8.2 pence per kilowatt hour. So that's the mean price between your daytime and your nighttime rates. And that goes to show, you know, heat pumps are at this time of the year uh, really cheap to operate. And by all means, March, yeah, there were some mild periods, but there are a lot of periods that were pretty grim and cold. Five degrees, not too many frosts, I will say. Now, one of the interesting things about the Solar Edge inverter is that it has the capability of direct communication over your local network using a protocol called Modbus. Now you may be asking the question, well, what on earth is Modbus? It is a communications protocol which is widely used in the industrial and automation industries. We use it in the uh, maritime industry and I've got quite a lot of experience with using it. It's been around for decades. You can use it on serial lines and you can use it on Ethernet as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to explore some of the options uh, which you have with the Solar Edge inverter. I'm not going to be doing a full introduction to Modbus. There are better people who can do that on the internet. Now, at this stage, you want to enable the Modbus uh, access on your inverter. Those people who have the set app on their phone and they have an installer account will be able to log into this inverter and they will be able to go through the menus and enable set app. However, I am also acutely aware of the fact that not everybody has an installer account. So my best advice to you in that situation is to go to Solar Edge support and raise a ticket requesting that they enable Modbus TCP on your inverter. So once we have enabled Modbus on the inverter, the next question is going to be, well, what documentation do we have in order to read values from the Modbus interface? So Solar Edge have got a specification for the logging of data via Modbus with a local machine acting as the Modbus master. The Solar Edge inverter would act as the Modbus slave and you can find the document uh, for the specification in the SunSpec implementation technical note. Now one thing I will say is that SunSpec is a common standard so you will find that this Modbus address list will probably work for other inverters as well. So if we go on to page 15, as an example, we have got some Modbus register mappings which can be read. You can see, as an example, we have got address 40,079 and this is the single phase voltage supply for the inverter. This is something which is of use to me in a different application for my heat pump, which I'm going to talk about in some detail in another video. But as an example, we have got address 40,079. If you are familiar with uh, Modbus, you will note that this is also function code free address 79. And we will talk about that. 
using a tool. And I have got such a tool here, it's called uh, the Modbus Master Tool, and we can use it to test the Modbus interface and we can use it to test signals which are on this Modbus interface. Now, if you want to know where you can download this tool, we can go here, Softpedia, and this Modbus tool is free to download. So what I'll do is just demonstrate uh, what we can do here. So the port address, the port number is 1502, and the IP address for the inverter is right here. It may be different in your instance. I would recommend you have a look at your internet router to find out what the IP address is that's assigned to your inverter. So what we'll do is we'll hit connect. So address 40,079, it corresponds with a holding register and it corresponds with, uh, uh, that's called function code free, uh, which is read holding registers and it's address 79. So this is register number 79. You can see that sometimes there's a register offset of one register here. And we're looking for the voltage AN. So as you can see here, we have got uh, a voltage here. We'll just uh, read that again, 239.5 volts. This is read as 2395. So you have to divide it by 10. Uh, there's nothing here in the specification to say that you need to scale it by a factor of 10. Um, but there are some examples here. So scale factors. So it's an alternative to a floating point format. So they're using unsigned integer 16. So that's got six by five, three, five integers that it supports. So it goes up to a value of 65535 in an unsigned fashion. So if you're having a positive integer, then you can use that scale, divide by 10 to get a proper, to, to, to get a more accurate scale. Um, and we can also poll this every two seconds. So if I click on poll, this will read these interfaces every two seconds. And as you can see, the voltage is indeed fluctuating like that, 240 volts. But it's all very well and good being able to use a test program to prove that a Modbus interface works and we've got values on particular registers, but we want to do something a bit more useful using a program which can be manipulated into something quite a bit more interesting in the future. So what we're going to do is have a look at what ChatGPT can do in terms of helping us to make a program which we can run. So what we're going to do is we're going to use Microsoft's Copilot, which uses ChatGPT. We're going to use it to uh, write a p program in Python, which we can use to read the Modbus slave on the inverter. And we can use that to read the voltage. So let's go ahead and give it an instruction. Please make a program in Python version 2.7, which will read a Modbus slave on IP address 192.168.1.186. I want you to read Modbus address 79 as a holding register returning an unsigned integer to the screen every two seconds. So we've given it the instruction. Let's see what it comes up with. So it is using PyMobbus as the library. Um, and it has uh, defined the uh, host address, which is correct. The port number, I didn't tell it, it's assumed 502, it's actually 1502. And the values are returned in a format which is Python 3. I tend to use Python 2.7 uh, simply because I don't really want to change my, uh, my existing code. Um, so yeah, it's given a, a, a nice, interesting example on how to read this. 
but I have done this a few times before and it came up with different suggestions and to be honest I like the other suggestions so we will use one of those as an example. So here's the example of the Python program which I created using Microsoft Bing previously. So it will read the Modbus register address on 79. It has a, a port number at 1502 and it will, if we look here, if there's a connection, it will read the holding register at the address here, which is 79, and it will then uh, do its thing. So the value is basically just going to be an integer which exists in this register. And the uh, what we do is we print the, uh, the, the value along with the Modbus address uh, to screen. So I'll show you what the result looks like on my Raspberry Pi. So if we go here, so here's my uh, Raspberry Pi. So if we run the test program, python test.py, you can see we've got 2398, 24402, and so on. So this is reading the voltage into a Python program, and that is very useful indeed. We will talk about that in future projects. Now, it doesn't just stop with reading values out of the inverter. Very useful that may be for some people. I do actually find the monitoring portal to be more than adequate for most of my needs when it comes to uh, getting data. However, we can do something else with Modbus. We can send outputs to the inverter in order to control things. And there is another document which I want to introduce to you. Now, in addition to this document here, there is another document which is called the Power Control Protocol. If we have a look here, this uh, is a Solar Edge document, but uh, I cannot find it on the Solar Edge libraries. I found a, a second-hand version of this on another website called Photovoltaic Forum. This is a power control protocol, and this is interesting for a number of reasons. This will allow you to control your battery using Modbus. Let's have a look at this particular chapter, Store Edge Control and Status Block. If we scroll down here, what do we have? We have got read and write values that we can have. We'll talk about those in a bit of detail later on. One of the things that is of interest is that the addressing doesn't look like Modbus addressing at first glance, but believe me, it is. This is just written in hexadecimal code. So what we will do is we will scroll down to another list down here, lots of read values here, and we can read the instantaneous voltage for the battery here. And I do have another Modbus Python program where we can read float 32 values. Now, floating point 32 bit values require two registers. You can see the size of signal here is two registers long. Now one register is equal to two bytes. So 32 bits is equal to four bytes. So what we are going to do is we're going to read address E170. And here is the program that we've got. It is somewhat different to our old program that we, where we're reading the voltage. For one thing, the register address you can uh, define as 0x E170. So the 0x is a prefix which you use to define a hex, hexadecimal number. And you can uh, then return the address here uh, as you see fit. And what we will do is we will also use a bit of extra code here, which is something I used in ChatGPT to define uh, how to combine two registers together to make a floating point value. So the result of this looks like this. Let's open it up here. And it returns the Modbus address as a decimal value rather than a hexadecimal value. Um, but you can see that the numbers look a bit crazy here. There are numbers, but this is quite common 
uh, with Modbus if you have not co configured things correctly. And if we go back to where we are, the uh, reason why they are not correct is because your registers are the wrong way round. So we want to use the register array number one and then the register array zero. And then we save that. So if we quit this program here, run it again, and what do you see? 405 volts. That looks like a very plausible value for the instantaneous voltage on the battery. And that gives you a very brief exercise in how we can use this power protocol. Let's go back to the document right here. This gives you a it, this validates this this value here. It validates the rest of the uh, the, the Modbus address uh, mappings. We can also read uh, Modbus strings here, so we can get the manufacturer's name, for example. It's not terribly useful for practical purposes, but I did use it on a previous test, and it came back with the the, the word Solar Edge, as you'd expect. So very interesting. But going back to these values here, this is what's going to be very interesting for people who have a solar edge battery. So what can we do with it? Well, let's go up to here. We can uh, change the uh, charge and discharge modes, for example. So we can uh, discharge to maximize export. We can uh, discharge to meet the load consumption uh, but there is uh, no discharging to the grid allowed um, and that's a situation where you probably don't want to charge the battery up for example um, and then you've got this mode here which is called remote control and this gives you quite a bit of extra that gives you quite a bit of uh, extra flexibility so uh, as an example Uh, you've got a charge limit with remote control. Uh, you've got a discharge limit with remote control. So you can you can change the wattage, at the rate at which you charge your battery up and discharge your battery. Not terribly useful, but what is useful is being able to manipulate the existing control modes, which I've got on the monitoring portal and have a bit more finesse about this. Now this will be a subject of another video in the future and what I want to do is uh, control peak shaving a bit better and then use uh, Modbus, use Python as a method for controlling the maximum discharge in the evening time uh, in a bit more of a nuanced fashion compared to what's available to you on the monitoring portal. So there we have it. We have now got the basic foundation of having a Python program, which we can then build and use to manipulate the battery to our liking in a much more precise and controlled fashion. The other interesting thing to note is that most of the good charge and discharge profiles are only available to installers. So we can use Modbus to get around this problem. So I think the situation with Modbus is that if all you want to do is read data from Modbus, there's not really too much extra that you can get from Modbus compared to the monitoring platform. The monitoring platform I have found very good and I haven't really explored the Modbus uh, features of the inverter uh, for three years for that very good reason. But when it comes to battery control, there are extra features and you can add your own formulas as to whether you want to charge or discharge the battery as you see fit. And I think that is a very useful feature to explore in the near future. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to look at Modbus in uh, more recent months is simply because I don't have power consumption information from my heat pump and in order to get accurate power consumption information I had to combine the current draw with the voltage supply and I could make assumptions about voltage supply but I thought to myself well we've got accurate voltage information from the inverter so why not use that information so hence my interest in Modbus communications all of a sudden but 
that's it for this video. In the next video, we are going to be talking about the heat pump performance in a bit more detail and the new analysis tool which I have created. So in the meantime, I'd like to thank you all for watching and I'll talk to you again very soon.